Good afternoon to everyone. This is Bonnie Goonan and I'm here with Susan Pittman today and we have a minute to go before we get started with the IP Day webinar today. You want me to do what? So we'll be right with you. Okay, Susan, I have that. It's 3 o'clock. How about you? Huh? It's 3 o'clock in North Carolina as well. <laughs> oh, sounds absolutely wonderful. Susan and I would like to welcome all of you to Part 2, Strategies for Teaching Argumentative Writing. And this is a webinar from the Institute for the Professional Development of Adult Education, better known as IPDE. Um, as Susan has noted, we hope that at this point you have downloaded the materials for this particular webinar because they're going to be very helpful as we're going to go through so much information today on really helping us dig a little bit deeper into teaching argumentative writing. Uh, but before we get started, I'm sure that you recognize both Susan and me. We've been with you before. And what we want to do is just talk briefly about what we're going to be going through today. Now, as we go through today's webinar, yes, you are all muted. However, you'll notice that you have a little chat box. And so as we start discussing the kinds of things that are going to make a difference as we teach, argumentative writing. If you've got any questions, comments, etc., please, please keyboard them into that chat box so that we can read through them and respond appropriately. So make sure that on your screen you note that little chat box and just keyboard your questions or your comments as we go along. So. Bonnie, there is one comment, and we'll go ahead and make this now because we'll hear it, I'm sure, several times. Um, if they don't have their materials at this point in time, they can go back to the email that they received to register, and they can get that link to the materials there, or after the webinar is over, they'll also have another opportunity to receive information about where those materials are located. Okay, that sounds fantastic, because you should have had both a PowerPoint and a workbook. So, what are we going to do today? We're going to dig deeper into strategies for teaching argumentative writing. And in this hour we have with you, we're going to talk about how do we help students better create those arguments that are supported by evidence? How can we assist them in getting a better organizational structure and progression of ideas? And of course, that ever important editing and revising. Just a quick note, quick update, as we look at this new GED test, which right now we are six months into. That's the aspect that constructed response, be it extended response in social studies and reasoning through language arts, or the two short answers continue to be a problem for our students. However, as we look at some of the data, it's real interesting to both Susan and me because what we do continue to see is on things such as reasoning through language arts where students have 45 minutes. They're not using that total time at all. And the same thing with social studies. They're not using the adequate time that's really necessary to get a creative and very well-written evidence-based response. So we really need to go that next step further, and we have to create more effective writers. And if we're going to do that, we really do need to teach one step at a time. The kinds of things that we're going to be sharing with you today definitely create some type of a lesson, but that lesson is going to go over multiple sessions with your students. It's not something that you can teach in one fell swoop. You probably see this and say, ah, that looks familiar. In fact, Susan and I have been sharing this process with all of you for now almost two years, I think, and that is when students go to to, uh, develop their extended response, they do have to go through a process. They need to be able to read well the passage and the question. 
They have to be able to unpack the prompt so that they know well what they're supposed to be writing about, that they identify those key words. And then, of course, we want our test takers or our students to rewrite the question in their own words and get a topic sentence or thesis statement, or if they're writing one of the short answers, to create a hypothesis. Then, of course, the process has our students collect relevant details from the passage and organize those details into a logical order. Finally, we want them to draft their answer and then, of course, that important part of rereading and editing and revising. So, we all know the process. And we also know the basic structure, that no longer are we looking at a five-paragraph essay structure, but rather a writing sample that has a beginning, a middle, and an ending, whether it's a paragraph or whether it's multiple paragraphs. And although we've shared all this with our students, we're finding that our students still are not writing effective argumentative types of writing styles. And so we've got to dig deeper. So, Susan, let's dig a little bit deeper into how do we teach students to develop and draft that effective argumentative response. Okay, well, then let's kind of start with the end in mind. And if we take a look at there's a little, as you can see on the PowerPoint here, we have this little response, and we call it response seven, and it's got all these different marks and legends and everything else on it. And we're going to take that apart as we go through, and we're going to keep talking about that. That is, that particular document can be found on pages one and two of the workbook that you received as a part of this. And so we'll be working through those different elements so we get a real feel for what this is and where we need to go. But first, let's skip just one quick question and say, what is argumentative writing? Because we're trying to look at things in a little bit of a different way. And so as Bonnie goes on to this next slide, you know, we have this a couple questions we need to be asking ourselves, and then we need to make sure our students under this as well, understand it as well. Why does it matter that we do argumentative writing? And how is it similar and different from the other types of writing that students have been doing in the past? And also, how can we teach that in the classroom? And the reality is that argumentative writing is important across a lot of different areas. In fact, as you go through and you talk about argumentative writing, you're talking about something that a person can use not just today in getting ready for a test, but something that they'll be used as that will be used as they move on into the workplace, as they go into post-secondary education. Argumentative writing requires that a student use critical thinking skills. And that's so important to think through this process because there are different parts of that argumentative writing. We have a claim, and we all know that students need to have a claim that they're laying out. This is where they're setting up their stance, how they're going to move forward. And then they have to support that with evidence. They can't just say, well, I think, or I want, or I feel like this is so and so, but rather, what is the evidence saying? And if you're in the workplace, and you have to respond to something that your supervisor has passed on to you, you're not going to do it just of, I believe, but rather you're going to state the facts. What is the evidence? And that's so critical in all of this. And as we go through, we're going to talk about a couple of other things that are involved in this and how we pull all of those pieces together. So let's take a look at why argument matters. When we support a claim, a writer has to go through and be able to identify and extract information from a primary or a secondary source. Now, we talk about primary sources when we talk about um, social studies many different times. But we have to be able to extract meaning from that. So our students have to become more effective readers. And they have to use those reasoning skills as they're going through. But they also have to look at this from a logical 
and a reasoned analysis of what the evidence within a document is telling them. They have to make sense of this and be able to evaluate what they're reading and understand that there are strengths and there are weaknesses that may be included in this evidence, and especially if you have something in there called a counterclaim, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So as we talk about argumentative writing, we're talking about um, having students support a position after they've read the information and they've supported it with evidence, evidence that is valid and it's relevant to what they've made as their claim. So there's some similarities between argumentative and that informative explanatory writing that we've been more used to. It uses transitional language, so it links different things. So we should be able to help students maybe expand their understanding of transitions from things like first, second, third to more complex material that's included there. And it really has a concluding statement, just like any other, that brings all the pieces together. And the other thing is that we look at it from a standpoint we need to have a formal style. The one thing that you need to keep in mind as we're going through with all of this and looking at argumentative writing and what the expectations are from students is that we have to get them out of the I mode and instead have them working into um, the, the more formal third person as we're working through this. Now, that's similarities, but there are also some differences that are out there. And these differences are big from a standpoint of how we've been teaching writing over the past. They have to defend a claim versus explaining some kind of topic. They have to prove a certain viewpoint versus just unpacking some kind of concept. And they have to support a point versus going in and examining an idea. So there's some real differences that are here. So let's take a look, and Bonnie, if you would, um, let's look at Toulmin and what Toulmin has to say about the elements of argument. You know, as Susan and I were looking at results of this new test and how our students are doing, it was really evident that what we were missing was the elements of argument. And so as we looked at the research, a name kept coming up over and over again of the gentleman who was basically the king of argumentative writing. In fact, for any of you who have ever taken a debate course or have taught debate, Toolman's name probably sounds very familiar. What he did was he identified the steps of an argument. And those steps really do create an effective writing sample for evidence-based writing for this new GED test, but also, as Susan said, for the workplace and post-secondary ed as well. And his comment was that the elements of an argument are as follows. There has to be a claim, a claim or a thesis. What are you going to prove or disprove? And that claim has to be based upon evidence. And we all know that our students now have to pull evidence from the sources and sometimes their own background knowledge. There also has to be a warrant. A warrant is a, a new word for some of us in adult ed, but a warrant basically explains how that evidence supports the claim. It's that connection piece. Then, of course, we have to have some backing. What supports? the evidence and the connection. And finally, we do want to refute anybody who goes against what our claim is, the rebuttals or the counterclaim, as Susan discussed earlier. What we want to do is take you through two ways of looking at this. Because yes, we do want all of us to look at this and start teaching it in the classroom. So the first time through, we're going to talk about the process of Toolman, and we're going to talk about what each of those steps are. And then we're going to go through one more time, and we're going to give you some different graphic organizers and classroom ideas to use with your students as you go back in to teach argumentative writing. So first things first, let's talk about digging deeper 
and the process of Toolman and how we're going to help our students become better readers and writers. First of all, we need to teach students to analyze and evaluate text. It's evident as we read lower uh, scored writing samples that one of the things students are missing in trait one is that they are not either analyzing or evaluating what they've read, but rather they're creating a summary. I read it, I summarize. That's not going to get them a good score. Because again, what we're looking for in that rubric is an analysis or an evaluation, not a description or a summary. So what does analyzing a text mean? It means that our students or our test takers are able to take a look at what they've read and examine the form or the content and the organizational structure of what they've read. We also want them to examine the author's purpose and perspective. My purpose in writing something such as um, you know, a letter to the editor is very different than my purpose in writing a speech or, of course, um, some of these primary sources such as the Declaration of Independence. We also want students to be able to, as they analyze the text, identify what the authors claim in as the reasons and whether the evidence is sufficient. And also, are there any errors in reasoning? Is what I think or what the author thinks and writes about logical? That's a whole different level of looking and reading and close reading than what we're used to doing. It is definitely higher order thinking skills. Now, when you look at trait one of the rubric, it says that students should analyze or evaluate the text and argument. Well, Evaluating the argument requires that our students analyze the purpose. Why did the writer create the argument? And to recognize the main claim and evaluate how it's expressed. To evaluate an argument, we need to also have students understand the structure of the argument and the reliability of the evidence. To me, a perfect example is we're all just so aware and familiar with that Daylight Savings Time article. Well, some of the research that was supporting the pro or con side was extremely old. It was research done in the 60s and 70s. So if I'm evaluating those writing samples that I've just read, I may say that the evidence is not as reliable as the evidence of newer research. Again, I'm digging deeper and I'm evaluating the argument and the reliability of the evidence. That's the first step, and that really is a strong step as we integrate more close reading skills into our adult ed classrooms. So first students need to read closely and analyze or evaluate. Then it's time for us to teach them the building blocks of what an effective argument is and what comprises each of these segments. One of the things to recognize as we look at these five different segments is the five segments don't necessarily create, quote, five paragraphs, but these elements need to be a part of the whole. And I think you'll see that a little bit clearer as we look at the writing sample in just a moment. So Susan, you want to talk a little bit about some of these steps? Sure. And if you would, um, open up the response seven, and we'll kind of take it through from there. Um, this is a document that you should have um, printed off already. If you have not, you can follow along with us as we go through this. But we're going to take these one step at a time. And what we did is, Bonnie and I were trying to look at, OK, this is all sounds great in, in, in research, but how does it really work when you actually look at a writing response? And so how can I break it down, or as Bonnie's been talking, dig deeper into the entire thing? So we're going to start out first with this thing that our students have to do, which is they have to set up a claim. And that claim is giving us a, what they're going to argue. It's the point that is trying to be made. And there are a couple of things. And Bonnie, I'm not sure if you can do this or not, but if you could enlarge that just a tab, it might be a little easier for somebody to, to read. If you, on your view, if you could pull it up a little bit higher.
But let's start out with the claim itself. That's the point that is actually done in green. And you see how it has all this highlighting in green, and it also has um, the actual text itself has been bolded. But in this particular case, the student has set up the claim. Between the two positions in this article, the one against daylight saving time is better supported. OK, if we use from that standpoint, now we can ask some questions. And those questions kind of go like this. Is that debatable? Well, yes. Somebody who read the article could say that, yes, well, I, you know, that's debatable. It could be that the one for it is stronger. So that answers part of the question. Is it narrow enough for the writing that's required? In other words, I don't want something that's so broad out there. I really can't respond to it appropriately because I've got way too much stuff included in it. But this is narrow. It's giving me a focus to all of this. Does it establish the argument? And it does in that, if you take a look at that other part that's in green, that says, the evidence supporting the view against DST is more specific and thorough. So they've made that, established the argument within that first paragraph by setting the claim and beginning that process of explaining why that's been done. And is it, yes, Bonnie? So does that mean I've just evaluated that that's, one side is more specific and thorough? That's exactly what it's done, because you've even put that into the argument itself by saying that here's why, and you've laid out the case, and now you're going to go and fine tune it as you begin to add more information to it. And what do we have to add to it? Well, we have to have evidence. I can say something's more specific and thorough, but I, now I've got to back that up. If I don't back it up, then I'm not hitting where I need to be. So let's take a look at the things that have been highlighted in yellow. Does it support the claim? Well, the writer brings up expenses, safety, and crime rates, all of which are supposedly improved through the use of DST. Well, that's putting in some evidence, but it's not necessarily supporting the claim, but looking toward that counterclaim, as Bonnie was talking about a minute ago. It says, one study took place in the 1970s. Again, that's another item that comes in that's very specific evidence from the actual article that the student read. But let's drop on down a little further. It says, we've got some more evidence that's in here. While the first author used studies from the 1970s, this one mentions a study done in 2007. So we're looking at that and the fact that the writer gives the states in which the studies were conducted and the reasons why the research believe they got those results. We go even further. We're still bringing in not my opinion on I think it's more specific and thorough, but how the author of the original text on daylight savings time did lay out that information. The energy consumption, safety, and confusion. So all of those different pieces are evidence. And let's look at what those things do. Does it support the claim? Does it include facts or statistics? And we've certainly got facts that are included in here. Does it give examples? And is it based on the experts or the writer's personal opinion? And in this case, it comes back and it's the expert. This is not about the writer saying, I think this is true, but this is what the writer has found as he or she has been moving through and reading. And as Bonnie said, evaluating the text itself. OK, that's good. We've got evidence scattered through this, which is the prompt it asks us to do to identify a claim, support it with evidence. But there's something missing there if we don't do the next part of it. And that's called the warrant. 
and that's a new term for us, although we could probably think about all those NCIS shows and everything else where after they've started gathering up evidence, they get a warrant to go in and get even more, but it's the same kind of thing. Does it explain the pieces of evidence? Because our students can't just make a list. They actually have to go through and they have to explain how this connection is made as they work through it. And does it connect that evidence back to the claim again? So let's look at the warrant. And that's the one with that little connection piece. It looks like a little bridge. And in fact, sometimes they call this the bridge. And what I can say from this one, and looking at the student's writing, is the writer's information is precise and he seems to use more studies than the first author. So see how there's a connection. It's not saying that, you know, and or just making a quote, but this student is actually connecting the pieces. Then if you look at the next one, the specifics of each study also improve the quality and the seeming validity of the arguments made. So we're coming back again saying, back to where we had up in our claim that the the argument is more specific and thorough. That's what we're trying to get at as we're moving through. And if we move down on page two, we can actually see that the second position is far better supported through its organization. And look at that, attention to detail. That comes back again. We're connecting back to being more specific and more thorough as we're working through. Without those pieces, all of this would merely be just a recitation of the facts. It would not provide the analysis or the evaluation that's needed in order to be a, a very uh, cohesive statement. <clears throat> Susan, I noticed that in the warrant that it never says things like, I think it's better, or, gee, this was a good idea. No, and it, because what are we trying to do? We're keeping our own personal opinion out of it, and we're staying in that more formal style of presenting and connecting the facts together. That's a big part of what we're trying to do as we move through. So let's take a look. There's another thing here, though. And it's like, OK, I've said all this stuff about having different evidence. You know, I've made my claim. I've got my evidence. What, why do I have to have a counterclaim? Well, sometimes showing the weakness of the other side actually enhances what we're trying to say. And so in this particular case, the student has said that in this counterclaim, the first position makes some valid points, ones that are sure to catch any reader's attention. That's the thing that this, what this student is trying to do, is to show that even though there's some good points in the other, this student believes the side that he or she has taken is the strongest. And we want students to be able to do that. And those counterclaims, they come back, is it reasonable? Well, sure, it's reasonable because there are some valid points in it. But as we go through, we're showing how the evidence from that side really helps convince people that the side we've taken is much stronger in moving through the process itself. So using a counterclaim is very important as they work through the process. Now, we do have one other thing, and that's called the rebuttal. Because if I'm going to lay out a counterclaim, I need to do the rebuttal on this and explain why that counterclaim just isn't strong enough. And so I've got some pieces in there. If I look back up into that first page, see those big stars? The stars are showing that Here's why the counterclaim just doesn't work and the other the side that I'm presenting is stronger. However, the evidence he uses to support this claim seems general and outdated. 
that's saying, hey, the evidence on the side that I selected is much stronger and it's much more recent. And then the other counterclaim, the other rebuttal that's in there is he also uses phrases such as many studies or other studies. Again, what did the student say in the original claim? The student said that supporting the view against DSD is more specific and thorough. Now that student has actually said why the view for it just really isn't that strong. And that's what we want students to do. That's what they're going to have to do as they move into some other areas that are there. So. Susan, when I was reading through some of the writing samples that are in the GED testing service, Reasoning Through Language Arts, I did notice that those that were scored better always did seem to go through this argumentative writing style with the claim and the counterclaim. So that's really different than what we're used to doing. Absolutely. And it is important that the student be cognizant of all of those these different pieces that are included in here because the student wants to make sure that they're building on what they need to. We have a question from uh, Susan Aaron who says, can we say that a general approach is for the student to address the weaker argument first, then conclude with the stronger argument that the student has chosen? And that's a good idea as you're coming in and you see within this one, this particular student did do much of that, laying out the foundation for why the other side doesn't work. It's not absolutely necessary. But at the same time, we want to make sure that as we're going back through, we're reiterating, and especially in that conclusion, why, again, this view that they have taken, either pro or con, is the better one to be supported. So, And one of the yeah, comments I would make about that is when you start looking through resources for argumentative writing, you're going to find that many of them put the rebuttal towards the end. Just like so many things we do in the writing process, there is not a right or wrong way to do it. Just realize it needs to be there. This particular one integrated it in the initial pair or the initial uh, body of the argument and it works very well. Other students they may find that after they've set their argument, their claim, their warrants, it is better towards the end. Again, there is not one right way to do it. And I, I think you just need to know that. So as you start looking at the different research articles as well as the different materials, just know that you're going to see that rebuttal in many different places. It's whatever works to make sure that that writing sample reads smoothly and is very connected. And that's a good point as you're coming through because as we're working with this, we have to keep in mind a couple of things that this is not something that we're going to only do for our GED students. We're going to begin this process much earlier as we're working through so that students have an opportunity to build their skills um, as we're working with this. And one of the questions that we have out there is like, how in the world are we going to teach this to all of this to a GED student? And Bonnie, I think we have some strategies that we want to talk about to show how we can do this. But I do want to say one thing, though not just to, that we're not going to just teach this to a GED student, we're also going to open this up and begin this process working with our ABE students as well. It's different than what we've been used to. It's changing the paradigm or those paradigm shifts, which I don't necessarily always like that term, but it's changing the way that we're we're working with our students to become more effective writers. It will take us some time as we're integrating all these pieces, but what we're going to share with you now as we move into the last half of this webinar itself is how we can go about doing that and some resources that you can use across the different levels. Because keep in mind, we have 
college and career readiness standards that are out there from the US DOE. And as we're looking at those, those take that across the different levels from our ABE all the way through to our high school completion students. So having said that, Bonnie, you want to take them into what it looks like and how we to do this in the classroom? Definitely. As we go through this next section, I want you to think in your mind about the students you have in the classroom because Susan and I were doing um, a workshop on this with a group of teachers and one of the teachers said, you know, I started out this process doing daylight savings time and I just lost my students. And I thought, yeah, I can understand that because it just wasn't where their thinking was. And she said, you're going to laugh at me. But she said, you know, the one that really clicked into them is, she said, I have a group of younger students and they're really into the superheroes. So she <laughs> said, I had them read something about um, Spider-Man and Captain, who was the other? Captain, Captain America. America. Yes. <laughs> and, and their job was to put a claim forth of which one was the greatest with evidence, reasoning, and counterclaims and rebuttals. And she said, you know, by working through some of these graphic organizers, they got it. And I thought, yeah. You know, we click, we often use those things of, think of the sports teams. You know, we just ended up with the basketball. That would have been a great one. Which team is going to win and why based upon something you've read? Or uh, something with now we've got, of course, the, the college baseball. Giving students two articles about two of the top teams and going through this process before we get to the more, shall we call it, theoretical writing that we often see for GED. Oh, so. and Bonnie, you know, we just had a couple people who popped in with some questions and, and comments coming through. And, you know, we do have Lindsay sitting out there who is a comic book geek. Who says she's, <laughs> all, she's all over that one. But we also had, how about the World Cup? That's a huge thing that's going on Definitely. as we move through. So keep thinking, guys, of different things that you see in the real world that you can pop in to begin this process. And think about the, the excitement and the interaction you could get going within the classroom itself in order to do this. And since we're into career tech, I think that I could even put out a job um, app there and have two students completed and the rest of the students would determine which one would be best suited for the job, I would think I'd have a claim evidence reasoning and definitely some rebuttals or counterclaims. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many options. And I think that's what really makes this such a nice thing to, a, a nice way for the writing to move um, into this looking at argument because there are, there are applications across so many different areas. We're really not limited. We have lots of different things that we can do. Okay, so now that we have your mindset at looking at real world things to start the process, I think what you're going to see as we go through this next section is we can indeed start this type of writing at a mid-level ABE so that by the time students get to the GED level, what we've done is really nothing more than increase the readability of what they're looking at. So, what does argument look like in the classroom? Well, we all know that we need to be able to teach students to evaluate data, make the claim, list the evidence, and identify those counterclaims and provide rebuttals. Probably the best place to get started is indeed to um, have students look at questions about the text and from that to be able to answer these kinds of questions. And it doesn't matter what they read. If I'm working on those kinds of things, my students need to be able to answer these kinds of questions. What's the author's argument? What position does the author take for or against? And what's one point, just one, that supports the author's argument? And then what evidence does the author give to support that point and the point of view? Again, one point of view of the author and one point of view that refutes the author. These are the types of things that work so well. And this would be step one. 
In fact, in my classroom, I wouldn't do anything but have students do close reading and be able to answer these kinds of questions before I go to the next step. So it's close reading and then discussing what you've read. But we do have to teach the structure of an effective argument. And if you go out that you're going to see all kinds of graphics. And when I saw this one, I thought, oh my goodness, that's the way my students would think their brain should be working on argumentative writing, and they'd run the other way. So we talked earlier that the structure for any writing should be an intro, a body, and a closing. So let's look at those three basic structures and look at what do we put into each one. Well, in our sample structure, in the introductory paragraph, we need to set the stage and get that hook so that our readers want to read what we've written. And in that introductory paragraph, we're going to want to introduce the claim or the thesis. Remembering that many writing books will tell you that thesis is at the end of the first paragraph. Some say that it needs to be at the beginning. It needs to be in the introductory paragraph. One of the other things as we're looking at that introductory paragraph is to remember it only sets the stage and introduces the claim. It doesn't give you everything. In fact, we have for a long time had different materials that have said, go ahead and put your ideas in the first paragraph. If you put all of those ideas in the first paragraph, why does anyone need to read the rest of your writing sample? So no, you don't need to. You need to just basically set the stage, provide the hook, and then introduce that claim or thesis. So what kinds of structures or what kinds of graphic organizers could we use for that? Well, there are a number of them that we've included in your workbook. One of them that's used often is called a V-chart. And no, Susan and I did not have a typo there. It's actually V-E-E. -E. And the V-chart basically has students just brainstorm. What does position one say? What does position two say? And what's the issue and what's your claim? A really easy way to get started with argumentative writing, because students can look at something and just identify those basic areas a great pre-writing graphic organizer. For those, of you, for those of you who are out there and you've printed off the materials, that graphic organizer, the V-chart, you can find on page 10. And so that's included as part of the document and you can work with it from there. And as Bonnie goes through and talks about a couple of these, all of them are included in your workbook itself, along with a lot of other information. You know, we always probably give you more than you ever thought you wanted, but anyhow. <laughs> but we have these included so you can work with them from there. So right now you should see a picture of that graphic organizer. That V chart is a pre-write. And I'm just going to keep in the workbook for a moment. Another pre-write that you may wish to use with students is just a simple pro-con, where students would put their question or statement at the top, and then they'd provide the evidence that supports it, which is the pro side, and the con side, their counter-argument, or the evidence that would oppose it. Just a quick comment of their decision for what their claim will be, and defend their decision. They've evaluated and analyzed, and this is what they've determined to be the best supported. Another pre-write, which works great before students get started actually writing. Toolman has a number of models out there, and you've got another graphic organizer here that is um, a little more, what do I want to say, expansive. Again, those first two would work very well for an ABE classroom to get started with the writing. But if you want to go that next step, this particular one provides an outline for that whole writing sample, where as students are pre-writing, they've got the prompt there, they've got the topic or issue. You'll notice even the purpose and audience. You may want to use this for everything from examples for the GED test to post-secondary ed to the workplace. But again, a step-by-step -step process, the type of graphic organizer that in the classroom what I would do is break it apart so students do not get overwhelmed. Now, if you're the type of person that prefers a graphic organizer, 
that is more picture oriented. Again, another pre-writing organizer and uses the Toolman method where in the top part it uh, reaffirms what a claim should be and the student would write their claim or statement there and then you'll notice there's some boxes. There's nothing magical about the number of boxes. Remember, I may only want to give one or two reasons, but there's four boxes there with a few ideas of evidence. And then again, a place to look at uh, for a refuting comment. And then finally, a couple ideas for conclusion. We've had a number of teachers who have used this one and, and have said their students really like it because it's not so massive and they feel like it's a place they can note take and then when they get ready to do the test, there again, they're ready to rock and roll. So that gives you a few graphic organizers to look at as we are indeed going that next step. And if that's, you, one of the, I, that's one of the things I think all of us have to keep in mind as we're working with this. You know your students and you know what will work best for your students. The main thing is that you keep them in the process, that they don't try to switch from one thing to another, but that you're really getting them focused and we want them to develop these kind of habits of mind so that when they get into the test, it's just automatic for them to think in these terms. We have to build that over time since it's very different from what we've done in the past. So, you know, as you have time after this webinar, Look at the different things and think about the students with whom you work and how these materials would work best within your classroom. And remember the other thing with all of this, it's about model, model, model. You have to show them and work through the process with them so they understand how is my, how do I think through this, how do I work through this, and the way they learn that is to watch you do that. And as you work with them more and more, they're going to become more comfortable. And especially if you throw it in some materials that are very interesting and things that um, are not what we would typically think of as our, quote, GED or ABE um, reading passages. So keep that in mind as you're working through. <laughs> And I'm going to add one more word to your model, Susan, and that is scaffold. You're not going to teach all of these steps in one lesson. Students need time to incorporate each step on their own after you've modeled so that they really own this structure or this process. So after they've pre-written and they have their wonderful intro, it is time for the body or the middle of the argument. And that's where you'll want students to offer their evidence to support their claim. This is where you'll want them to um, connect or explore the warrants. And this is where you're going to want those counter arguments and that rebuttal, knowing that all of this goes together. In fact, one of your fellow teachers said, well, you know, is there a problem with putting more than one piece of evidence in a paragraph? And no, there's not. It is not that prescriptive to say for each piece of evidence it should be a paragraph, for the rebuttal it should be a paragraph. No. You know, we have some teachers out there who were teaching six paragraphs, thinking everything had to be separate. The important thing is to incorporate the elements and to connect them together. And Bonnie, um, as we're going through and we're talking about this, June has just brought up a really good point. And that is that we still have, and this is something that all of us have to be aware of as we're working with students, that we still have students who don't understand how the writing works when they actually get in to keyboard their stuff into the computer and they're taking the test. They are only looking at that little bitty box, and what happens is that they're not realizing that that box expands. Because as Bonnie has been taking you through, she's been talking about the fact that sometimes it's just a paragraph that I'm writing, and sometimes it's multiple paragraphs. I can't, we can't say enough, because this comes up over and over again, how important it is for our students to go through the tutorial for the computer 
as well as learn this writing process because that's going to help them with that. And so as students go through, that text box is going to expand, allowing them more room. Now they're not going to see everything that they write into it. They'll have to scroll back and forth. But they need to know they have the space to do the very thing you're teaching them to do by putting together these different parts of the claim and the evidence and so on as they move through. So June, good point that you're bringing up and we'll reiterate that again one more time as we go to close out, but it's something to keep in mind. We've got to teach the process, but we also have to make sure our students understand how to put that process to work when they get into the test itself. And probably one of the easiest acronyms as we go through argumentative writing, since we're from Florida, we had to do something Floridian, so we've got the nice orange peels. And that is whether students are making a claim or a counterclaim, they've got to have the point. That point has to be supported by evidence, an explanation, and then of course a linkage to the next point. That sounds like progression of ideas to me. And finally, a formal style throughout. You will see in some of the writing samples from GED testing service the aspect that students will occasionally when writing use the word I. Please again note that the best writing or the most effective writing does stay formal or in third person. So there again, nice easy acronym to remember as we look through, okay, what does argumentative writing need? It needs a point, it needs evidence, it needs explanation, linkage, and of course formal style. And it really is, as students are writing, like building that chain of evidence, where that evidence just again chains together and then that counter argument tries to break the chain, but that evidence comes back and forth. So a couple analogies for you to use in the classroom when students say, okay, what is the process? What should I be looking for? And those are the types of things that need to be incorporated into the body of the writing sample. Last but not least, of course, we have the conclusion or ending. And that really needs to be an item that's significant that the reader needs to take away. It's not just a reiteration of the first paragraph, but we want students to be able to show the reader the implications of the argument with maybe a short summary or a final statement that is memorable. So as you're done, you'll go, aha, yes. I agree with the, the writer. That really was a well-written extended response. Now, one thing to remember is, and I think this is one of those things that students don't ever do enough of, but after they've written their response, remember in Reasoning Through Language Arts, they have 45 minutes and they can't use those 45 minutes on anything but the writing sample. They need to go back and they need to be able to use good skills in revision and editing. And that means they're able to revise and edit. Not that they come to us as the instructor and say, can you help? Yes, we can assist, but they need to be able to incorporate those skills. So we found just a couple websites for you to take a look at, because as I was looking at these websites and saw some of the, the common errors that writers make, I thought, Oh yes, I've seen those. So take a look at those three websites. I think you're going to find some of them are going to be real interesting for your students to use and you can send them there so that they understand these are things which they need to really look at. But the other thing Susan and I put together for you is in your workbook a couple things. First of all, in your workbook on page 15 is what GED testing service provides students. Before they take the RLA test, they should read this through because it tells them what they're expecting to see in argumentative writing. So it's a nice way as students start writing, you can say, okay, take a read through this. Did you? 
show which position was presented that was better supported? Did you explain? Did you defend? This should be something that all students are very familiar with. But then there's another part of the editing and revision process, and sometimes the easiest route to go is to have a checklist. And so you have a sample checklist, which again, you can add, delete to, but what it does is it first of all looks at the intro, the body paragraphs, and the conclusion, and has students ask themselves these questions about what they've just written. Then from there, it has them look at the entire paper. And again, questions such as, is the writing in formal style? Does one idea flow? Some of these things should look familiar to you as you look through the rubric, because those are the kinds of things that the rubric looks at and assesses whether the student would get a zero, a one, or a two in each of those three traits. So just another tool for you to use in the classroom with your students. And again, as Susan said before, not just your GED level students, but all levels of students as we teach them all to become more effective writers. So, do you need more ideas? There's a few more that you can access that Susan and I have provided besides the workbook, which again, all of those materials are there available for you to use. And as you read through that workbook, you'll notice that you do have an overview of the Tumlin uh, method as well as some different websites that I think you'll find of interest to you. But also don't forget the fact that on Florida IP Day, which will be the new website URL in just a bit, there will continue to be more and more materials for you to access as the instructor. Not only, of course, the handbook, but there will be more lesson plans, more grab and goes that are, again, um, aligned with this new GED test and, of course, lower level ABE as well. And don't forget, of course, the framework, the GED framework from Florida. So having said that, Susan, questions that we have out there? Well, I think we have quite a few of those answered at this point in time. Um, the uh, one comment we did have, and hopefully I've responded to it so that everybody can understand, the test takers do have an erasable notepad. Now, they don't do the erasing on the erasable notepad. It is actually done by the proctor who is doing the testing. But if a student needs more another notepad, then they have access to it. So it's not a case of, well, now I, I've used up my whole pad and, and I, I need more space. So they actually have an option to do that. Um, they have to erase it in a, with a special uh, formula of some kind, and so it's just easier for the proctor to do that. Um, one of the other questions that came up uh, really is about the fact of the students and being comfortable with the technology and does that impact students in terms of their not being able to see the whole document and uh, after they've written it. And the reality is that you know there are some trade-offs that happen when you're using things on computer, but all of their continued work and, and what they're seeing from the analytics as well as what they found from the um, actual field study itself is that the students are doing fine as long as they have actually practiced using that computer tutorial so they understand the scroll bar is there and they can go back and they can look at the information. Um, there's, you know, sometimes you have so much, so many resources that you, we may miss a few things as we go along the, the way and so we have to make sure that uh, we are accessing everything that's out there because it is going to make a difference for us as we go through. Um, and also, uh, Lindsay brings up another comment that they have to recognize that they have those page tabs at the top for reading excerpts as well. And that's a good point, Lindsay, because if I don't read the whole text, then I'll be missing some things. So I have to be really careful with that. So a couple of things. We have to look at how we are changing the way we're teaching writing, and not just for our GED students, but students across the board. Um, we've got to get some processes, some uh, habits of mind going for students. 
And we also have to make sure that along the way we're not missing out on resources that are out there through the GED testing service as well as the different things that Bonnie's pointed out is here. Um, the resources that you can access from the internet that will be useful to you as well. So thank you, you know, so much for your comments and your questions as we were going through. Um, we really appreciate everything that we're seeing and, you know, we have quite a job ahead of us as we're getting students into this new mode, but we can all do it. And, you know, part of that comes from looking at you today as all of you have participated in this. So, Bonnie, I'll turn it back to you. One last thing, you'll notice that we've got a few websites and they're going to look very familiar to you, but if you've not gone out to Purdue OWL to that specific area dealing with argumentative writing, this will get you there. But there are a number of other sites that are also absolutely wonderful. Uh, the University of Richmond has a step-by-step -step process that takes you through argumentative writing. And we've put up one of the wiki spaces there. This is an instructor who has put together all kinds of different websites for you to access. And, you know, there really are some great ones that will assist you as you work um, on getting students to closer read as well as to write in an argumentative style. And last but not least, Colorado State University has a whole writing studio that's being used not only by their um, post-secondary ed system, but also has had input from the adult ed system too as we've gone towards writing in an argumentative style. I think the big thing out there is this is not a new way of writing. In fact, one of your fellow teachers the other day said, you know, this is marvelous. She said, this is the way I was taught to write as I went through college. And she said, it's fantastic that I now get to use this style of writing. She said, I don't know how to write any other way. So as we go forward, yes, there's some work to do, and we do know that. But we're going to leave you with good old Stephen King, because I think he said it best when he said, if you want to be a writer, you must do two things above all others. You have to read a lot, and you have to write a lot. There's no way around these two things that I'm aware of. There's no shortcut. And so, Susan, I want to leave you with the same, same comment, and that is, if we want our students to become more effective writers, we need to have them read a lot, and we need to have them write a lot. So, on behalf of Susan and me today, and if day, we'd like to thank you for being with us. And we'll leave you with a quote from a Florida 2014 graduate who said, don't just sit around and think about it. Get up and do it. We hope that all of you have something out of today's workshop that you can say, yes, I can get up and put this into practice in my classroom tomorrow. Susan, anything else? I think that does it. Again, thank you for spending time with us. We do appreciate it, and we look forward to more things in the future. See you guys later. Thank you.